Good day, everybody. Zach Kortz here with Revzilla, joined as always by Spurgeon Dunbar. This is High Side, Low Side, Season 7, Episode 1. Our topic today will be the season's most exciting upcoming motorcycles, and our guest is Mr. Lance Oliver. Also on the program, swappable battery motorcycle technology in Kenya, ethics in dealerships, and more. But first, as always, a word from our sponsor. Motul is back for sponsorship of season seven of High Side, Low Side. And over the break, we got an email from Rohai from India saying, I've recently purchased my first motorcycle, a Suzuki V-Strom 650 XT, which Motul oil is recommended. The dealership gave me two options, Motul 300V and Motul 7100. Just keep in mind with Motul 300V, that's aimed more at racing applications. So if you're racing your V-Strom, that might be the option for you, but most v Eastrom owners are just using it in regular everyday conditions. And if that sounds like you, Rohai, I'd recommend going with Motul's 7100 series. And you can check out Motul's full line of products over at revzilla.com slash Motul. That's M-O-T-U-L. And while you're over there on revzilla.com, check out the RPM program. RPM gets you a lot of discounts and benefits across the entire Revzilla sphere, including a Rever Pro membership. So if you're planning a road trip or maybe you're doing some off-road trail riding and you want some extra help mapping out your adventure, that Rever Pro membership will come in handy. You can learn more about all the benefits of the RPM program over on revzilla.com slash RPM. Let's get this show started. Well, who would have thought they brought us back for another season? Uh, here we are. <laughs> here we are. We keep thinking we're going to get fired, and yet we're on season seven of High Side, Low Side. If you are uh, joining us for the first time, then feel free to binge those first six seasons if you like. Um, if, if you're a seasoned veteran of High Side, Low Side, welcome back. Um, those of you watching the video version of the podcast, we'll see. I'm in a different place. I'm coming at you live from the set of the shop manual. Mm. Do you like my new background, Spurge? I love the light in the back. I, now, mm. the, the audience doesn't know this, but we actually went through a few variations as we were preparing for this episode. Uh, and Zach, <laughs> at one point, had the shop manual uh, sign in a strobe fashion. Um, yes. But we were we were concerned for anyone in the audience that might have um, situations with epilepsy. So we decided <laughs> to just stick with a, a regular solid uh, light there. We did, we did, but it, this this really overstates my mechanical ability. Even just like recording a podcast uh, from the set of the shop manual, but I do like it. It makes me feel makes me feel like a like a real motorcyclist. You know, I got a toolbox in the background, and there's even some tools in it and near it. We can get you some Motul excellent. oil and let you change some. We can do some oil changes after this episode is done. Uh, we should put yeah. some Motul on the bench. Mm. Why didn't we think of that? Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Anyway, um, we should uh, we should move right along into this podcast. Of course, the the first item on the list is not the news. Friendly reminder that um, this is not a news centric podcast. But we do like to bring up stories with a with a sort of a broad scope in the motorcycling world now and again, so that we do not get uh, carried away and end up with the news segment taking up 10 or 15 minutes of the podcast. Um, we're self-aware re enough to realize that that has happened in the past. We've got a new plan for season seven, which is a three-minute timer on the Not the News segment. Is that right, Spurge? We're going to gamify this a little bit. So our producer, <laughs> Chase, has a buzzer, and it's possibly one of the more annoying sounds in the world. If you are an <laughs> Apple iPhone user and you uh, have it set for your alarm tone, like I do, so every time we... we you know, started playing this game in pre-production, I would have these flashbacks to having to wake up in the morning. And it wasn't <laughs> pleasant, but we're going to do three minutes. We're not going to go through this explanation every single time either. This no. is really your treat here for being the first ones listening to uh, <laughs> uh, the first episode of season seven. So without any further ado, I'm going to snap my fingers, which will start the timer. Zach, I'm going to let you introduce... Oh, wait. Zach's holding his finger up for those of you listening. We, we introduce the topic and then we start the timer, remember? Oh, oh. Good call. Right. Okay. So, Zach, introduce the topic. <laughs> I'm, I'm the topic holding steady with my fingers ready to snap. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so timer's about to start. The topic today is swappable uh, battery technology in motorcycles in Kenya. We think this is fascinating and we would like to discuss. Go. Zach, you wrote an article about this on Common Tread, so why don't you I give did. us the gist of what this is about? The gist is... Um, Kenya, interestingly, is a nation 
um, in East Africa, Africa, in case yep. you were not familiar. Um, and Kenya gets a lot of its electricity from natural sources. Um, and uh, because of that, they are perhaps more adept at experimenting with ways to use battery technology in transportation. One of the ways they're doing this is there's a few startups in Nairobi specifically um, that have uh, swappable batteries set up for motorcycle taxis. So instead of a motorcycle, like a little 150cc air-cooled single cylinder motorcycle bopping about and um, taking people from place to place as they have historically done, uh, there are similarly simple motorcycles with a swap electric motorcycles with a battery that you can pull out. Um, so sort of like swapping your propane at, uh, at Home Depot or the gas station, wherever, right? You bring them an empty propane bottle, you give them 20 bucks, you get a new propane bottle, that kind of thing. So the idea is you do that with the motorcycle battery and you can use two or three batteries over the course of a day it doesn't take you very long to fill up you just pop a new battery in there and um, some riders have learned that it is in fact cheaper than um than doing so with gasoline and there's uh much less maintenance on the motorcycle very interesting uh concept we talk a lot about the potential for swappable batteries and electric motorcycles um and it's, it's i think oftentimes really centers around uh europe or north america or um, places like that, but I think it's pretty cool that's happening in East Africa. Boom. Done. Yeah. Well, so I, I think there's a larger conversation slash implication here around, you know, some of the things that we'll get into throughout season seven, you know, we'll yes. kind of get back to electric vehicles, right? That's a yes. big talking point right now. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll hit on that throughout episodes. But one of the things that Zach and I have talked about often is in order for electric to take off in the motorcycle world, you either have to have extremely quick charging or you have to have some kind of swappable battery because the batteries are just not as big as they are in cars, which severely limit limit the range of motorcycles compared to electric uh, automobiles. And I, I think we've seen swappable battery technology introduced in Japan. This is now something that has been introduced in Kenya. And the question is, what is the right way to go forward? Is it swappable batteries in motorcycles? Which, in order to do that, you have to have all the OEMs kind of moving towards the same battery technology. Mm -hmm. Or do you stick with what's currently on the table, which is fast charging? Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a difficult um, quandary, and I I appreciate that you brought up the fact that they have been introduced elsewhere because there are a couple. There was a startup I think we covered on Common Tread as well uh, in uh, Gogoro. Is it Gogoro? Was it? Go, maybe go, I think it was go, Taiwan. Go. Maybe yeah, Taiwan. Anyway, um, that is doing a similar thing. Yep. So it's happening elsewhere as well, but it does seem like the infrastructure is is was ripe um, for this to happen, and it's it's actually happening um, in in Nairobi, as far as we can tell, and it's pretty cool. Oh. Oh. That's an example. Hang on. <laughs> tell me. No, wait. I was going to let it keep playing. How do you keep playing it, Chase? You made it stop. Oh. Seriously, anyway. that sound is horrible. Uh, we'll have to get a clip of that just to make sure the audience can hear it outright, because here, this is... Tell me that doesn't it's, just cause shivers to roll down your spine with just, you know, memories of having to roll out of bed at five o'clock in the morning. More Ugh. to the point, if you'd like to learn more about um, Common Tread's coverage of swappable electric motorcycle batteries, specifically in Kenya and other places, I suppose, um, you can go to uh, the Common Tread blog at RevZilla.com and read more about it. And uh, we will speak know more about it on this podcast because the timer went off. Revzilla.com backslash common dash tread is uh, what you would type <laughs> in. And then honestly, in the search bar, if you just type in swappable batteries, there's a few stories on there. Um, yes. so, so make sure you're always checking out common tread for your daily dose of news. But for now, speaking of common tread, the mm. managing editor, the silver mm. fox himself, mm. Lance mm -hmm. Oliver, it's time to get him on to the podcast for the first time. We haven't seen him in six months. Let's get him on here. All right. There he is, Lance Oliver, in the flesh, sort of. Uh, how have you been, Lance? As Spurgeon just said, it's been six months since you were a guest on High Side, Low Side. Does it feel longer than that or shorter than that? Uh, well, I can't remember what I said the last time, so it must, it must <laughs> feel longer. I don't know. <laughs> you're looking you're looking like you've been uh you know having a lovely winter you're you're pale you you're you're yes. alone there in a quiet <laughs> snowy yes. place <laughs> yes here we are in the north country <laughs> just trying to paint a picture for our audience yeah. <laughs> really really flattering well done Sprinch. Uh, yeah. sure, really appreciate that so lance you made a lot of jokes i just want to address this head on for the whole audience you you've made plenty of illusions that you are not necessarily excited to be on high side low side it's mm. not it's not mm. your favorite part of the week do you think that's a fair assessment of your 
participation here? Well, let's just say in the past I've been told I have a, you know, if you've heard the saying you have a face for radio, um, <laughs> I, I kind of have a personality for print, too. So, you know, <laughs> at, least, at least that's what I've been told. So, you know, I well, just, uh, I would like you to know that um, I I did a, a Instagram Live happy hour yesterday, which is something that the RevZilla Instagram feed uh, features one RevZilla host per Wednesday mm-hmm. afternoon and evening, as you may know. And uh, someone commented, love Lance on the podcast. Would Lance please do an Instagram Live? Is Lance Ooh, ever going to do Instagram uh, Live? And I said, I don't know if that's in his contract. I bet that would be very expensive. Not I'm not sure it's going to yeah. happen. Okay, yeah, okay. Might have well, to reopen negotiations. I don't know. <laughs> I just want you to know that you that there were at least one person was a big fan of you on the podcast and so much so that they were just like, man, if Lance would just do an Instagram live and I could ask him some personal questions, mm-hmm. that would be amazing. So so like while we have you on the record here, Lance, what would it cost? How if if I like <laughs> what would it cost to get you to to log in and do an Instagram live? And I know that you know how to use Instagram because you follow along to all of our Instagram lives. Um what what would it cost? We're talking a hundred dollars? Two hundred dollars. Oh, come on, come on. Three hundred dollars for thirty this minutes got a of your time. Fireplace in the background of his yeah. Zoom call. You think a hundred bucks is going to swing? Hey, you could start. You way. could start a fire. You could pour a lovely rum cocktail <laughs> and just answer people's questions on Instagram. Uh, I don't think a good negotiator would put his price right out there in front of everybody to nice, see right at the nice. start of good his call. Person. Good call. His lawyer will be in touch with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my people. My people will be in touch with your people. Exactly. Okay. So <laughs> let's. <laughs> Before before we uh, this conversation derail, derails derail any more than it already has <laughs> too late. Um, let's uh, let's let's kick off this here episode of High Side Low Side. The topic is 2023 motorcycles. You know, some of which we've seen, some we haven't. The 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 season's most exciting motorcycles, and I think it's only fair. Correct me if I'm wrong, Spurgeon Dunbar, to start with guest honors, and Lance Oliver can tell us which motorcycle, uh, e- either either coming up or just poked its head out of a of a research lab in some factory is he most excited about in 2023? No, I think we absolutely will start with Lance. I think for the audience, it's important to note that we are recording this uh, probably about three to four weeks uh, before you're actually listening to it. And my <laughs> point in saying that is that it's been a busy start of the season already. We've mm-hmm. seen a lot of bikes announced. We've had a lot of press launches. And I would assume that as we get into 2023, uh, based on, on what we have to talk about today, there's there's even more bikes coming. So from from that perspective, Lance, whether it's the bikes we've already started to see released or the ones that we have future prospects on, guess honors, what what has you the most jazzed up? Well, okay, so I'm going to break the rules right from the start and, and not, not necessarily, yeah. <laughs> it's, like Cal- about- it's, like, it's like Calvin Ball, baby. The yeah, rules are only there to be go. changed. Yeah, exactly. No, it's not not so much what I'm I'm most interested in, or what I think is the best motorcycle, or or, or the most important one, or, but I, I just can't help but I, I can't overlook, um, what I would say is maybe the wackiest, uh, least expected for me motorcycle that's just come out, and that. So as we're recording this, it is during Bike Week in Daytona. As Persia mentioned, we're a little ahead. And down in Florida, Indian just unveiled his Challenger RR, which I have to say, nice. I did mm-hmm. not see that coming. I'm not saying I this is not a personal endorsement or condoning of that motorcycle. <laughs> it's it's so, got my attention. So to be clear, for the for the audience's edification, the Challenger RR is a uh, is a king of the baggers racing challenger so so a sort of like a a a replica or a customer build of the bike that jeremy mcwilliams and tyler o'hara raced in king of the baggers last year and will race again this year so it is an extremely modified indian challenger with a hugely tall seat and uh, and no lights built for racing and it's it's fantastically expensive as well is that right exactly they they basically took the the challenger that Tyler O'Hara rode to the championship last year in, in King of the Baggers in Motor Can America. Can somebody explain and what they, King of the Baggers is for those people listening that have okay, no okay, idea? Fair enough, what fair we're we can back about. up even more. That's yeah. fair. That's so fair. It, it started in 2020. I mean, it was basically the, they noticed that all these uh, shops is, were building these high performance baggers. It was like the new thing, and I thought, well, hey, what if we like had a race? And so they had a race in 2020, and then that became a series in 2021, and it became a more of a series in 2022. And this year they're having six rounds uh, in conjunction with Moto America, Superbike, and so forth. So uh, it's become quite a quite a part of the show, and it's got it's generated a lot of buzz. And of course, some people think it's a total abomination to have these 600-pound baggers out there racing around, and other people think it's just 
hilarious fun. So, and, and when we're uh, using the term baggers, we're talking about American V twin large cruiser yes. touring motorcycles with actual luggage on these bikes. So even though yes. they're we're racing these bikes, part of the rules state that you still have to have the hard bags on the back, right? Yeah, not not the not the original hard bags. You have to have bags. They're jacked way up high so they don't drag, and they're made of carbon fiber, and they. They have to be a size where you can actually open the lid and you can fit a certain size of box inside them. So there are, are rules on on the bags. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't be baggers. But uh, so, uh, you know, back when we did our 2023 Motorcycle Predictions article, Patrick Garvin said, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a, a, a King of the Baggers model from Harley or Indian. And I thought, you know, that's, that's not a bad idea. They can you know, take one of their baggers and give it the best suspension they have and the best brakes they have and hop up the engine a little bit and put some stickers on it and call it a day. Well, we, that's not what we saw. What what Indian has done is they, they got SNS Cycle, who builds their race bike, to build 29 copies of Tyler O'Hara's bike, basically. And so they're hand-built. There's only 29 of them. And they cost a uh, sobering $92,299. We can yeah. round up to like ninety three, right? Yeah. Like it's like, like a ninety three like thousand dollar motorcycle. Yeah. I like that even at that price, they were like, well, it'd be ninety two thousand dollars two hundred and ninety nine. Now we don't want right. to say ninety two thousand three hundred because we don't want like people to lot. be shocked by the price. So that we'll sounds say like, like a lot you know, if you say that three hundred. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, so ninety two thousand two ninety nine. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, so and, and, but, and to be yeah, clear, this is a this is if I'm understanding your article correctly here. Um, and again, this is if you if you are wanting to see exactly what we're talking about. Maybe you're a, a newer rider and you're not sure. You're still not being able to picture when we say the term bagger. Uh, you, there is an article on Common Trade about this. This is a track only bike. This yes. is not a bike you can ride in the street. Track, uh, nope. So not for street 90, legal. 93, 92,299 dollars, you are going to buy this and just use it for track days, basically. Or park it in your garage but and look at it. Mm. Or mm. yeah, I mean, Those there's are your certain, choices. They're gonna, they're gonna be some collectors out there, but like sure. I think one of the one of the things that someone could do is they could race it, right? I mean, that's 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 certainly yeah. one application that you could. There sure. are privateer bagger racers. There are people out there who are sort of building their own, or or you know, they're 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 going racing with some kit that is that is um, that's less than factory, and I think. You know, so you could you could get this bike and go racing on it, right? Isn't that isn't that like at least one of the I, I theories guess, behind yeah, it? You, you could. This may not be the best way to accomplish that, but you could do that. Yeah. So yeah, you could either know. buy you know a Suzuki SV650 and go race <laughs> at a club for like six thousand dollars, or you can invest a cool hundred grand and uh, you know maybe go that way. I will yeah. say so, Zach. On the th of the three of us on the podcast right now. You're the only one that's ridden one of these bikes. Now, not the Indian one, but you did get a chance to ride a, a, a the the Harley Davidson Factory King of the Baggers bike. Um, True. What can you tell us about these motorcycles for people that are listening that will probably never get to actually ride one? Uh, well, it is a very unique motorcycling experience. They're very strange bikes. So if you're if you can imagine a, a Harley Davidson. Um, uh, road glide or an Indian challenger. These are, you know, as, as, as we talked about before, right? These are sort of like large, um, touring bikes from Harley Davidson and Indian with saddlebags on them. And in order to make them go around a racetrack, you need to, you need to do some weird stuff to the, to the bike. So it's a, the, the, the bike that I rode was, um, uh, Kyle Wyman's championship winning bike from 2021, I believe. Is that right, Lance? You yeah, that's right. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just this very strange motorcycle. It's really tall because um, Harley Davidson engines are fairly wide. And granted, this is a large Harley Davidson engine. It's not like a a, a smaller, mid-sized Harley Davidson engine. This is a massive, massive engine. So it, they have to make the bike really tall so that when you lean over, you don't drag the engine. Pistons and it's also, the size of like paint cans. Picture that. <laughs> Picture a paint can yeah, for your piston. It's also very long. Um, and uh and very heavy i don't remember the numbers exactly off the top of my head um but uh the seat height was something like 37 inches or something yeah, like that i remember inches. it was it was the same as like the ktm rally that's in my garage it was like yeah, a rally style much suspension wider. seat yeah 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 and i'm so i'm six foot two and they did not the harley davidson factory team was there to 
to help me ride it um, or, you know, whatever, prep the bike before I rode it. And uh, they did not let me take off by myself. They said, put your feet on the foot pegs. We'll hold the bike up. It was like learn how to ride with like a, you know, a bike with training wheels with your parents way back in the day. And they were like, we'll push you and you can go, but don't put your feet down because you're not going to be able to reach and it's going to be awkward and it's not going to work. So, and I'm six foot two. So it gives you an idea of how tall the bike is. It's, it's incredibly awkward. Um, but once you get going, uh, surprisingly um, adept at carving through corners. It's got big superbike slicks on it and, um, and big stonking brakes. Um, and it is strange and, and heavy and, um, you know, from an outright sprinting speed perspective, like on the straightaways, it's not terribly fast, but it is, it is again, a unique experience to have a massive engine there thundering away and you're way up high up off the pavement, <laughs> um, flying down a straightaway. Um, and, uh, and yeah, as far as like braking and turning, it was, it was amazingly good for how big it was. Um, though certainly the bikes don't set any sort of new performance standard. That's for sure. All right. Well, that is yeah. one heck of a way to kick off this episode uh, with a ninety-two thousand dollar behemoth yeah. track only Indian. I should say also, you're probably sick of us hearing at this point, but there is also a common trade article and a YouTube video of me riding uh, that uh, Harley Davidson King of the Baggers race bike. Should you be so inclined, it does exist. We've got all the bagger coverage over there on Common <laughs> Track. <laughs> well, so uh, Lance I, threw the first one out. Zach, I was going to throw it to you, but do you have something else you want to add to this before we move on? No, no, no. I think I, I, I was going to do the same. I was going to let you go next. Uh, but if, no, you, no, if you're no. telling me I should go next, then I want okay, yeah. Okay. Well, so so well, Lance threw down the gauntlet I, with an Indian Challenger RR. What do you what do you have that you're most excited about? I'm going to go in a fairly predictable direction, and I thought it was the direction Lance was going going to go in, but. But he is not a predictable man, as he has shown us. Uh, I was going to say Kawasaki ZX4RR, mm. which is a, a little, um, it's not the Ninja 400. If you're familiar with Kawasaki's Ninja 400, which is a little uh, parallel twin, uh, $5,500 um, small sport bike, um, the ZX4RR is a 400cc inline four, um, about double the price, um, and uh, and sort of probably approximately double the potential on a racetrack. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail here because we do have more plans to cover this bike uh, in a future episode. So I don't want to go too deep on the ZX4RR, but it is an exciting and interesting bike for Kawasaki to have debuted. Um, and, and, and I'm not wrong in saying that you that one sort of piqued your interest one way or another. Is that right, Lance? Oh, absolutely. I think it's interesting on a, on a lot of levels, both for the uh, sort of the uniqueness of what it is in the marketplace for uh i wrote an article saying is this a future cult bike because i think it's interesting that this is sort of mm -hmm. the exact example of how you end up with a cult bike 10 years down the road <laughs> uh, I, I think I, I commend kawasaki for making it and i think it's it is probably the most interesting bike this year that i think yeah spurge it's a ten thousand dollar motorcycle essentially um it's uh, i think it's going to be misunderstood and I don't want to get I don't want to get too far into that because that's kind of what I think we'll talk on later on. But I think that there's okay. a lot of people that are going to look at this bike and think that it's a beginner motorcycle, and right. it is not. This is a this is an a, this is a, a, a advanced weapon to be used in a very specific situation, and and I think I would just leave it at that for now, with knowing that we want to provide some extra talking points around this in the future. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good way to that's a good way to put it. We talked about that a little bit, and I think that's a that's a fun fun little synopsis. Um, but I, but what, so I yeah, will, you, what I will say, just very quickly, to add to what Zach uh, threw out, is that it's not just that it's a different engine; it's a it's a different chassis, right? Like it's an upgrade. It's a high end suspension. It's a high end chassis. It's essentially a lot of the high end componentry that the Ninja Four Hundred is a little bit more budget focused, even though it's right. become quite favorable. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, it is an interesting bike, and we will talk about it more. So if you really are hot to trot to, to talk about small sport bikes or the ZX4RR in particular, stay tuned to High Side, Low Side in Season 7. We're going we're gonna to talk more about that. But for now, I would like to, I'd like to throw it to you, Spurge, um, for, for your sort of um, your pick of the litter before we dive into other stuff. Oh, so, I mean, I've got, I've got a lot of stuff written down today. I, I should, I, <laughs> that should come as no surprise to you. But I do want to kick off... I'll stick with the track theme, right? So we've we've talked about big old baggers. We've talked about pint-sized little screamer four-cylinders. The bike <laughs> that I am most excited about, um, 
from a from a sport bike track perspective is the Triumph Street Triple Moto 2. Now, ah. Ari Henning just got back from Spain where he got to ride the new Street Triple R and the Street Triple RS. Phenomenal motorcycles. We could do an entire podcast about like the bang for the buck that Triumph is providing to the market with the Street Triple line. He didn't get to ride the Moto 2, which I think is a crying shame, Triumph. You flew the kid over to Spain and put him <laughs> on a racetrack and didn't let him ride the Moto 2 version of this motorcycle. But I am excited about that version. I think that okay, it's a so, bit... So before, before oh, sorry, you dive yeah. in, yeah. quick quick synopsis of the model. The Triumph Street Triple is the uh, smaller naked sport bike of Triumph's line. That's a 765cc triple. Um, used to be a 675 triple mm -hmm. um, and has grown into um, one of Triumph's sort of like most celebrated and best-selling uh, sporting bikes. It's sort of mid-sized 765cc uh, triple. Comes in different uh, uh, versions and now it's an R and RS and a Moto 2 and the Moto 2 is the sort of most aggressive version of the street triple that we've seen. It has clip-on handlebars instead of a triple clamp mounted handlebar yeah. and uh, and it just has some up spec stuff on it, right? Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. So basically okay. if you're looking at the R, that's like the lowest tiered suspension uh, and doesn't have all the same whiz-bang electronics. When you get up into the RS you get uh, an upgraded suspension and then when you get up into the Moto 2 it's, it's really about clip-on handlebars which are a little bit lower and more aggressive than the standard handlebar that comes with it. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm putting my hand in fun places <laughs> to show you. And then it also gets an even more up, upgraded suspension over that. Here's why I'm excited about this bike, is that the, the Street Triple RS is just magnificent. It's a great track bike. It's a great street bike. It's comfortable all the way around. I'm interested to see if the Moto2 is wildly uncomfortable and kind of ruins it or if the moto 2 takes what the rs is already doing so well and makes it even more you know weapon like is it is it is it one step better at being the scalpel that you really want to be out there to carve in the track does it sacrifice all the comfort on the street I, I, I'm looking at both of you have ridden street triples and street triple RSs. So mm -hmm. am I am I crazy in thinking that the Moto Two might be something fun and cool and maybe a step forward, or do we think it's going to be a step too far? That's a good. It's a good question. I think that anyone that's ridden um, that bike could ask the question. What if it was just a little bit more? What if it was just a little bit more? But certainly, if you go too far, then it then you'd go too far. So, Lance, what what's your would would you would you change a single thing about the one that you rode uh, previously? Uh, yeah. So I rode the previous uh, version, uh, not the one that obviously the the uh, Ari just got to ride, but the previous one that was a great bike, as Spurgeon said. Um, I mean, I, I feel like the the great thing about the Street Triple line in addition to, as Spurgeon said, just the general all-around goodness of it, is that they do give you some options. And is the Moto2 going to be too much? Well, yeah, for some people, it's not. It's <laughs> going to be more aggressive than what they want. So, But that's why you've got the R and the RS. So uh, I think for some people, the Moto2 will probably end up being just exactly what they want. Uh, yeah. Especially since, you know, Triumph no longer is making the 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 fully fared sport bikes that they used to make. Right. This gives you something that's functionally, you know, just as good. I think that's yeah. a great point for the, for this line, and I think it's a good theme to keep in mind. I think the RS ends up being more aggressive than what most people want. I think people make the mistake of buying the more expensive one, and this yeah. does not just hold true <laughs> for Triumph, but like they buy the more expensive one thinking yeah. that it's the quote-unquote better one, and I'm right. using air quotes if you're listening, because... <sighs> The, the RS is probably more aggressive than what the average person is going to want out of a street bike. And then, I, yeah. Zach, you did the Daily Rider on the R, I believe. And, like, the R is a very competent motorcycle in its own right. Extremely. Extremely, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I can see the day now for my new perch here in Revzilla West office for, for podcasting. I can see the Daily Rider uh, board here so I can tell where the street triple ended up. And... Uh, and if it was the R, the RS, and it was the R. Good, good memory there, Spurge. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think that to Lance's point, uh, one of the beauties of that line of motorcycles is that it ha is, is wide, right? It has, it has options, you know? You're not just sort of like, um, I, I hesitate to use the word stuck, but I mean, if you think about many other bikes, I can like look at the Daily Rider Leader, I can tell. So Indian <laughs> FTR. So there are technically different versions of the FTR, but like, 
it's basically the bike you get is the bike you get. You get the same, you know, you get the same engine, the same amount of power, the same. There's a, an upgraded suspension one, I think. But the point is, a lot of bikes you sort of decide if you want that or you don't. Whereas this, the Street Triple, you get the, um, you get lots of different things you can you can choose from, which is pretty cool. And I will say, with the new ones, the colors are awesome. So like, yeah. I, I do want to give Triumph a little. You probably can't yes. hear that because uh, the sound canceling of our technology is is limiting my clapping. But I'm <laughs> clapping because I think the colors that Triumph is coming out with with this bike uh, definitely have piqued my interest. And and the RS is a bike that is on my list of like uh, I would like to have one in my garage at cer at some point in time mm, uh, nice. as, a, yeah. as an owner. But I, I think that the Moto Two is one that I'm interested to see how it measures up. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I would like to pivot this conversation to a a topic near and dear to your heart, Spurgeon Dunbar, and mm. talk about a couple of adventuresome motorcycles that have uh, popped up for, for 2023, uh, namely the, um, the old P-Strom 800, as you would call it, the new V-Strom, um, as well as Honda Transalp, which uh, has not been announced in the United States yet, so we won't, as far as I know, unless we um, take an intercontinental trip, be able to tell if the Transalp is better than a new V-Strom 800, we're going to have to read some other journalist's article about that. Um, but you must have some, you must have some excitement about bikes like that, no? Yeah, I think I think as I've been watching the ADV crowd, you know, the, the middleweight crowd especially expand over the past couple of years, it's been nothing short of exciting. And if you're if you're not familiar with what we're talking about, Suzuki traditionally has had a V-Strom 1050, which is a big uh, V-twin adventure style motorcycle and then a smaller v-strom 650 which is a smaller uh v-twin l l twin technically uh adventure style motorcycle the new suzuki v-strom 800 de is a parallel twin you're shaking your head no am i am i, I wrong i just don't like the term l twin i just think it's right, dumb it's a v-twin they're, they're all v-twins we go. we're you. gonna we're gonna follow the zach quartz dictionary <laughs> of v technology uh for this podcast so the V-Strom 800 DE is a parallel twin. Both cylinders are going straight up and down right next to one another. It's coming in at a, a base price of 11350 And if you're looking at where this fits in, uh, in the middleweight segment, that is uh, just north of a Yamaha Tenere 700, which is around 10500 and just south of an Aprilia Touring 660, which is $13,700. Mm -hmm. So... If you're trying to compare it against those two models, the, the biggest difference, I think, is going to be the weight. The V-Strom is reportedly north of 500 pounds, uh, which really makes it on the, on the heavier side of, of middleweights. And I do think it's probably not going to have the same level of technology as the Aprilia Toric, but probably more technology than the, than the, the, the Yamaha. So it kind of does right. fit right there in that, in that range. Yeah, do you have any uh, do you have any predictions, Lance, of um, of where the where the parallel twin V-Strom fits into the motorcycling world? Do you think it'll be a worthy successor to the to this? And to be clear, the V-Strom 650 is not going away. Is that accurate? I don't think there's any plans to get rid of the V-Strom 650 yet that I, Suzuki has announced. I have wondered about that and asked about that myself, but I don't have a definitive answer beyond the fact that right, right. now they're they're both going to stick around. I don't know how yep. long that'll last, but uh, yeah, for now you can still go with the V-Strom 650 twi V twin or the or the new 800. Um, m you know, my feeling is, and I, I, I'll I'll defer to Spurgeon. I'd like to ask him about this because he's the he's far more expert in this class of bikes than I am. But my feeling is that the V-Strom doesn't really compete with the the, the Tenere 700 and the and the Touareg. I feel like the 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 Transalp that we're going to talk about is is a direct competitor with those two. But to me, just the fact that the V-Strom is more street-focused and significantly heavier uh, yeah. means it's not really directly competing. I, I, just, I just don't see people Which, choosing between a Tenere 700 and a, and a, and a V-Strom. Spurgeon, would you say that's true or not? Yeah. Well, Go ahead. Well, Zach, you want to say something? Go ahead. I, I just think I think that's a very fair, fair point to bring up. Is that historically a Tenere 700 buyer has been someone who's probably more off-road focused and more interested in 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 you know rough and tumble terrain, whereas historically a V-Strom 650 rider, you often see V-Strom 650s that are just for touring, basically, they're just being used as sport touring bikes, and they're quite good at that, to be fair. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not as sort of um, gnarly and adventurous um, as as other adventure type bikes. Just a, just a quick reminder: is the is the V-Strom 800 
front wheel a 21. So that's the big change here. Yeah. Right? And I, so I, I it used think, to be a 19-inch think... front wheel, right? And now it's historically, a 21. Right? Historically, you're yeah. right. Historically, if you're looking at the, the V-Strom series, they were aimed more at, at – on road riding. Although I will say I, I took an adventure with uh, old Ryan Fortnite once and he was on a big old beast <laughs> right. and he just beat the <laughs> out of it. Um, so it can be done. Um, but with a big shift with the v 800 is that they're going to, a sus uh, it's a show of suspension with almost nine inches of travel front and back. Um, it's they're, they're going to a 21 inch front wheel setup. Um, now it's a 21 inch front, 17 inch rear. And for those of you listening that don't understand what that means, um, the 17-inch rear is something that you know Triumph and BMW have stuck with. It's a little bit more road-friendly from a tire sizing standpoint. The way that Suzuki has kind of positioned this new V-Storm 800, I think they are going after a bit more of the off-road audience. I just think that they're going after the off-road audience on a bike that's going to be sized more like a, a BMW F850 GS. That's really the closest bike that I can see competing with this. And if you're factoring in the the, the BMW price is somewhere north of $15,000 uh, to get into a new F850 GS. That's where I think the, the Suzuki is still going to be more competitive. Um, but I don't yeah, think you're going to see, I don't think you're going to see Suzuki pulling sales away from necessarily Yamaha, Aprilia, or even the, the KTM 890 at this point. Mm. Yeah, well, it'd be interesting to, to see. I am, I think that uh, with the um, introduction of the Tenere 700 and the Touareg 660 and um, other bikes as well, perhaps, I guess the V-Strom 800, if nothing else, um, it's interesting to me that Honda has not said that, that it will bring the Transalp to the U.S. at this point because it feels like a pretty good, I mean, that's that's kind of an interesting bike, right? I feel like I don't know how, you know, Lance, you said you think it's going to be a little bit more aggressive, right? Again, again, 21 inch front wheel. And it sounds like you sort of think that'll be more of a, a true adventure type bike. Is that the impression that you're under? And do you think well, that it's, it's, it's like uh, if Honda's missing the boat by not bringing it to American consumers? I mean, I have to believe Honda's going to bring it here. I, 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 w I don't understand why they wouldn't. It's already, uh, you know, it's already out in Europe. So it's a known quantity in that sense. Yeah. And it's to me, it's a direct competitor to the to something like the Tenere 700. It's uh, you know, it's the same weight. It's uh, equipped with similar similar components. Yeah. Um, we don't know what the price would be here, but the price over there in Europe is is similar. So to me, it's it's very much a direct competitor to the Tenere 700, and I don't understand why you wouldn't want to sell it here. Yeah, I I, I, I don't know. I, it's it seems like a cool. It seems like a cool addition to a class that is already pretty exciting. But I brought and, this up. I brought this up before. Uh, go ahead, Lance. Say it. No, say I was just going to. The thing I didn't mention. So the the intriguing part is that according to Honda, it's also more powerful than the Tenere 700. So uh, it may have. It uh, may be. Uh, it may match the competition in terms of weight components and everything else. But they have one one up on terms of. Uh, it's a little more powerful. Maybe. Well, that and was Honda doesn't typically make stuff more expensive than other brands usually. They usually undercut. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's yeah, which is be exciting. Yeah. But but here's the deal. I, I as an adventure motorcyclist, as you know, the the <laughs> one of us here that actually you know owns one of these modern bikes in his garage, the Transalp to me, I I don't understand, and, and I don't understand it within Honda's line because Honda has the Africa Twin, right, and they've made the Africa Twin progressively bigger and progressively more complicated. So when the Honda Twin was introduced in America in 2016, that was a bike that made similar torque to what the, the Transalp is now supposed to make. The Transalp might be a little bit below the Africa Twin, but it was close. And that Transalp doesn't have the same top end horsepower specs, but it was close. So it seems like Honda introduced the Africa Twin uh, six years ago. They've continued to increase the displacement of the Africa Twin and the complexity and the electronics to the point where the Africa Twin is no longer appealing to the average adventure rider in that middleweight segment. So then now they're like, okay, well, let's go back and build essentially a detuned version of the original Africa Twin and release it as the Transalp. So <laughs> yeah, why would you not, not go back? That's not totally fair. I feel like you say you don't understand the bike, but then you just you just made a case for it. You're like, they made the Africa Twin so big that now there's nothing smaller. So they made a smaller one. So why like, would no, you just understand why you're pissed off about that? 
Why wouldn't you go back and buy a used Africa twin? That's your argument? Why wouldn't you just buy a used Africa twin that some other dude, some uh, other Spurgeon Dunbar has slammed into sand washes Spurgeon for the past Dunbar six years? Would never <laughs> treat an adventure bike like that. He maintains his vehicles to the highest letter of the law. The point is, I don't think, it, like, Honda, considering how many motorcycles Honda has made over the decades, if if every time uh, people at Honda went to redesign a motorcycle, they thought, wow, we are we may already made that one way back when. So if someone wanted, a, <laughs> a, you know, a 650 sport bike, well, heck, they could just get the a CX 650 from 1987 or what's whatever. The, That's not, what's, what's the weight on the Transalp? Do either you know? I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Lance, it seems like you might have done some research on um, this. It's... What it? I, like I just, 460? I just, no, no. I, I made a note that in Europe the the weights were identical to the to the Tenere 700. So whatever okay. the Tenere is. So then it would be it would be. It was within I would a say, couple of pounds. Literally, yeah. So within then, a couple of pounds. If, if, yeah, if that's the case, low it's force, probably mid force, four, low force. Was, yeah, it would probably be 40 to 50 pounds lighter than the original Africa Twin. Uh, the original yeah. Africa Twin was a heavy bike. So I mean, I've, yeah. I feel like that's a different model. There's room in the. I feel like it's 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 differentiated enough from the Africa Twin that it makes sense to would, have both bikes. I would think you it like is, to see? I think it is now. I think because the <laughs> Africa Twin has gotten so big that yes, you're right now. And I think that it's important to note that from an aesthetic perspective, it looks different. It looks a little bit smaller. Looks a little bit more compact. Yeah. Um, so for people that you know, and and I think that's important to note that oftentimes we forget that we we as motorcyclists buy with our eyes and something you know sometimes we're willing to forgive certain sins if it looks good. Um, so I can understand that <laughs> point of view as well. I will say I don't think the Transalp looks as good as an Africa Twin. Oh, there's another perspective that's uglier, says uh, yeah. Quartz. <laughs> Let's we'll put that okay, on. The I didn't use the U word, but yeah, I. I <laughs> I uh, I don't know. I just think the Africa Twin is is a very has been since it was introduced and continues to be a very handsome adventure bike in my opinion. It is, but I will tell you, and then and I'm I'm a terrible test case because I'm not your typical adventure bike buyer because you know how many I own. But if I were walking in to the dealership, I would absolutely be looking a lot closer at something like a Transalp than I would at an Africa Twin because right. to me it just feels like overkill. And yeah, he, that, that would be even true of the original one that Spurgeon was talking about. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I and and the Transalp also we have to remember that was that's another one of those that was kind of a cult bike because it, it sold in in Europe for for uh, you know two decades, but it only sold in the United States for two years. The original Transalp back in the eighties, right? And um, which was a seven fifty V twin? Is that right? It was actually a five eighty three. It was five eighty three. It was smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize and, it was so much smaller. Okay. And you know it sold for two. It didn't sell for two years, I should say. And 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 uh, <laughs> it, it was kind of ahead of its time, I think, really. Yeah. And because I, I, I remember myself, uh, I was in the market to buy a used dual sport back in the two thousands, and you never saw those things pop up. And one popped up, and I thought, well, hey, that's interesting. And and of course, the price was way higher than everything else because they were as rare as as right. you you could ever hope. What so. what dual sport did you end up buying? Uh, well, I had a, a BMW, I had the original BMW F650. That's not where I thought you were going with this. What was that tiny and dual I had, sport you I also had, I also had a Honda <laughs> NX250. That's what I was saying. So I had, ah, those are the two, okay. those are the two I had that would be described as dual sports. And if you, if you took a, a BMW F650 single and, and, a, and the Honda NX and you kind of like, you know, put them in a cartoon tumble dryer and like <laughs> uh, like a transalp might be what would come out right it would be uh, like i don't nope. think it works that way sick <laughs> no, that's why it's a cartoon tumble dryer lance oh, doesn't work yes. that way i'm just so, uh, i'm just asking you before we leave the adventure category um you, and you know talking about aesthetics one of the new models this year that's getting a light update is the uh the 890 uh ktm 890 adventure r and I have a bone to pick with KTM only because they're introducing this now with the blue tank from the rally. So all the special, <laughs> all the specialness of having the rally was the fact no. that I got a blue tank. And now every Ooh. Yahoo can go out and spend regular money and get a KTM 890 Venture R and they get oh. the damn blue tank. And I'm not oh. happy about this. No. Oh. How, why would you be? My goodness. Your <laughs> vanity. Your van they're burning your vanity for, for light. Through the roof. Through the roof. Brutal. So My goodness. On, on that note, uh, <laughs> we have much more to talk about, but let's take a quick pause for a word from our sponsor, Motul. All right. Back from the lovely Motul break that you just got to experience. Uh, we want to shift gears away from ADV 
but not too far away. <laughs> um, Want to kind of talk for something uh, around the dual sports segment. So let's get smaller than ADV. And we did an episode, I believe it was last season, around uh, dual sport versus adventure bike. And we kind of talked yeah. through some of the nuance there. So if you're not sure about the difference in terms, we've got an episode for you, boy, oh boy. <laughs> but for right now, Honda has announced that America is going to get an XR150L. Yeah. This is, this is a 3000 I'm going to round up here. I'm not going to pull what Lance did with the $92,399 <laughs> bagger uh, or whatever the hell it cost. I'm going to say they're, they're releasing a $3,000 dual sport street legal motorcycle that's uh, about 150 cc's. It weighs. Anybody, anybody do the research on how much this thing weighs? How much do you think? Two hundred eighty-two. Two hundred eighty-two. We both did the research. Well, we you guys are both very educated. This That's bike, good. for what it's worth, podcast listeners, was not on the list that that producer Chase provided. We all agreed that we should do our own research and come up with motorcycles that deserve discussing. And apparently, all three of us went. We, we did tripped over this uh, XR one hundred and fifty. Continue, Spurgeon. I'm just no, very I, impressed with us. I, Pat on the I, back to everybody. I, I'm just <laughs> curious. As whether it's people listening, um, people that are hosting with me here, like, does the world need this? Is this something we are excited about? Now, here's the reason why, and I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this out there. Zach and I were doing um, some video content together recently, and we were talking about the weights of certain motorcycles. And mm -hmm. I said to him, I said, you know, it's interesting because you know Nicole, uh, my loving fiance, we got her a KLX 230L from Kawasaki. Mm -hmm. awesome little bike approachable little machine but it weighs 291 pounds 291 pounds and for someone that is half of my size her picking up a, a 291 pound motorcycle is the equivalent of me picking up an adventure motorcycle right so even though it's small in size it's not it's not necessarily small in weight and necessarily easy to wrangle around and, and this honda right. you're basically getting less power with almost the same amount of weight and the mm. 230l isn't a powerhouse of a machine to begin with so uh for a little bit of context um in in the in, in the in the dirt bike world spurgeon dunbar owns a um <clears throat> ktm 350 excf is that right excf yep so, um, and that's a that's a 350 cc uh, dual sport, but quite quite aggressive. I mean, not not like a motocross bike aggressive, but like an aggressive off road. It motorcycle might, it would, might as yeah, it might as well be. Well, it's yes, so, it's very performance oriented. So, and that bike weighs what 240, 245. It's uh, according to according to the internet, the new one is it got a claimed weight of under 240 pounds. Okay, so that's why he is offended, uh, dear listeners, by this XR150 weighing 282 pounds or a Kawasaki KLX uh, 230 weighing 291 pounds because the, the, the aggressive uh, expert level dual sport bike weighs less, which seems, and it's taller and it's more aggressive, as yeah. you said, but it seems unfair, doesn't it, that uh, the, the beginner bike would weigh more. And of course, that's because they use cheaper materials and, and heavier materials and that kind of thing to build these bikes, but... But if uh, I'm out, if I'm out riding, if I'm out riding with Nicole, and like we both were to crash, um, <laughs> it, it would be easier for her to pick up my bike in theory than it would be for me to pick up her bike, in theory. Theory. Anyway, Lance, I have I have uh, plenty to say on this topic, but I want uh, I want your take first, uh, guest honor, since he brought up the XR150. What do you what do you what do you make of this? Well, you know, it, it goes back to that old saying which you just alluded to: you, you can have cheap light or strong choose any two <laughs> and you know he, the the advantage of the xr 150 is it's inexpensive i mean it's two thousand dollars less than that klx 230 and they weigh about the same so the advantage is not that it's lighter the advantage of the xr is that it's significantly Cheaper. less expensive yeah, yeah. now I mean, spurgeon it's... got to the i think spurgeon inadvertently hit the real point with his uh, first sentence when he said, does the world need this? And yes, the world does need this. The real question is, does the U.S. market need it? Because the world <laughs> is swarming with these kind of bikes. If you go to South America, you go to Asia, you're going to see people all day, all over the place, riding a dual sport like, like this one because it's inexpensive transportation. It handles the crummy roads. It's mm -hmm. cheap to operate and maintain. And so, yeah, the world needs these a lot. Whether or not the U.S. market does or does not is another question. And frankly, I'd you know rather have a KLX 230 because I wouldn't be worried about getting run over if I go on a road that's uh, you know more than 55 <laughs> miles per hour and speed limit. 
Yeah. Well, that's the. Do you have a rebuttal there, Spurge? I think I, the uh, the American <laughs> audience. So. <sighs> This depends on where you're listening to this podcast, because if you're listening to this in the Northeast or pretty much anywhere east of the Mississippi River, you're limited to to riding motorcycles in areas. If you want to go ride off road, you need to have a license plate in a lot of cases. Um, it just makes it so much easier to be able to go mm -hmm. ride off road unless you're going to a motocross track and spending money. And then you need a truck or a trailer and you're going to haul your bike back and forth. So I like what Honda's doing here. They're making a smaller displacement bike. Uh, for people that want to learn how to ride off road that need a license plate, um, but I I don't and and to Lance's point, it's two thousand dollars cheaper than the than the the KLX is, and maybe if this bike existed when we bought Nicole her bike, we would have just said, hey, let's yeah. save some money and buy the Honda because she doesn't know the difference anyway, and she's just out <laughs> putting around on trails. So yeah. for I mean, for that audience, I think this does serve a purpose. I mean. That like to me, that's the thing. Like three thousand dollars for a new dual sport bike, for a new bike that you can just ride around. I mean, Honda is sort of famously um, accommodating for for uh, with prices, right? Do you think that's fair to say? You guys, yeah. they have a lot of bikes that are small and and um, arguably priced. Reasonably. They hold that whole mini moto lineup. You got the the monkey, the Grom, the Trail One Twenty Five, the Super Cub. Um, and then you have 150 cc scooters like the ADV 150 or the PCX 150. Um, those are all more expensive than this XR 150, which I think is notable. They're, they're all those are all 125 or 150 cc machines that are all more expensive than this bike. The only bikes that Honda makes that are cheaper than the the XR 150 currently for sale, I believe would be the Navi, which is the 110 cc uh, sort of scooter dressed up as a motorcycle, which is incredibly cheap, it's like 1800 bucks. And then you can get a Ruckus or a Metropolitan with your 50 cc scooters essentially for 29 and 2600 bucks respectively. And so, those are those are bikes with license plates on them. Because if you go into Honda's dirt line, yes. then it goes in a yes, whole yes, other yes. pricing structure. Yes, I'm only counting yeah. bikes with license plates on them yep. because as you pointed out, Spurge, that's one of the big advantages of this XR150 is that yeah. it's, not just, uh, it's not just a bike you put on the back of the motorhome and you can only use in the off-road riding area or something like that. It's a bike you can put on the back of a motorhome and ride into town legally. Um, it's a bike that you I don't have to put on the motorhome. If you're looking to ride to the trail, correct. you can put down your country road until you get to a little yeah. off-road riding area. I, so I so I, I love the what Lance said about how like the world clearly needs these bikes, but does the American market want them? You know, that's that's a really good question, and uh, I think it's a fun will be a fun one to see how how it plays out. I hope that people kind of snap these things up because I think it's a really interesting. Uh, thing that Honda is doing whereby this bike exists elsewhere. So all the tooling is made, all the manufacturing is already happening. And Honda has the ability because it's such a behemoth in the motorcycling world or in the, in the power sports world that it can produce this motorcycle on American showrooms and sell it very affordably. And I think that's so admirable because that's what, that's what the behemoths of the motorcycling world need to be doing. In my opinion is producing motorcycles that are accessible and easy uh, for, for certain people. And Honda just is so good at it. And I think this is yet another um, uh, sort of uh, brilliant example of that. And whether or not it works from a market standpoint remains to be seen. But I just, I, I think the uh, Honda deserves a round of applause for it. I, I mean, Lance, is one of these in your future? You're always talking about getting back into a affordable dual sport. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, if I were buying a dual sport, I would definitely stick to the 250 class. And I, I would just point out, well, well, Spurgeon is in, in this little threesome here. Spurgeon is uh, undisputably the expert in big adventure bikes, and Zach uh, rides the fancy Panigale stuff around racetracks far faster <laughs> than I've ever gone in my life. But uh, I will say I'm the only one who's done a multi state, multi day trip on a 125cc air cooled diddler. So this is my this is my area of expertise here, such as it is. Um, <laughs> But I would say, uh, yeah, I, I think the 250 class has a lot going for it in the United States context, just because you have a little more comfortable ability to uh, go on just about any road you want. Yeah, well, I will say, uh, not to undercut your claim, um, Lance, but I did ride down the entire Baja Peninsula, uh, 1,200 miles on a Honda Monkey, and I did ride across all of Alaska 1,000 miles on yeah, Honda Trail 125. Yeah, but you got paid to do it. I did get paid. That's true. Yeah. What I was going to say is not so much to rub that in your face, but to say that if I had ridden down Baja 
for a thousand miles or 1200 miles or across Alaska for 1100 miles, instead of being on a monkey or a trail 125 respectively, if I had been on an XR 150, I'm fairly certain I would have been happier yeah. <laughs> and more comfortable yeah. and the bike would have been more capable. Um, and it's cheaper than either of those bikes that I did those trips on. So, so, uh, I, I just, uh, I hadn't thought of that in context, but it's, it's yet another good point you've made Lance. <laughs> Well, there we go. So it sounds like in the dual sports segment, Honda might have uh, a winner on their hands with the XR 150L. Uh, we uh -huh. will have to wait and see how that plays out. But uh, Zach, why don't you throw another one out that you're excited about or interested let's, on? Let's pivot here. Okay. Um, I let's, let's talk about some large motorcycles, shall we? Some mm -hmm. large engines, larger mm -hmm. anyway. Um, I'm thinking in the cruiser segment, we've seen uh, we saw the Indian Sport Chief. Mm -hmm. um, which is the sort of larger air-cooled Indian um, power plant. Um, I forget what it's called. Thunderstroke, is that right? Um, the Thunderstroke 116 right. is the one 116, in that, yeah. 116, cubic inch engine. Um, and it's sort of a, a Indian's version of Harley-Davidson's Lowrider S, which is sort of like a sporty cruiser. And then Honda also released the Rebel 1100T, which is um, a Rebel 1100 with some hard bags on the back and uh, and like a little kind of like bikini bat wing uh, fairing on it. Um, those two bikes aren't necessarily competitors, but it's a, it's, I'd like to pivot to that class and talk about those bikes because I'm kind of, I'm interested and I guess I hesitate to say excited, but intrigued and, um, and, and I'm brought hope by the sport chief. And I'm curious what, uh, what you guys think. Well, uh, let's not forget. So Lance, you did the article comparing, um, or, or talking about the, the, the Harley Davidson, uh, breakout as it compares to the sport chief as another 2023 model. Um, ah, fair enough. Yeah. So when you know, I think we can we can kind of set. I, I would I want to talk about the Honda Rebel 1100, um, but I think if we're looking at you know apples to apples, I think looking at the the Sport Chief and the Harley Davidson Breakout side by side, you know, I, I think it's important to note that a lot of uh, consumers, you know, especially in the cruiser segment, are excited about paint jobs and you know the the style of the motorcycle and the overall looks and how they're positioning it. And I think when you're looking at the performance of both of those bikes side by side, they're they're darn near close in performance. So I think it is going to come down a lot to from an aesthetic standpoint. And I think in my mind, Indian is just crushing it right now. Like if I'm looking at the 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 Indian uh, Sport Chief next to the Harley Davidson Breakout, personally from an aesthetic standpoint, I, I think the the Sport Chief is a really good looking motorcycle. Yeah, well, that's that's why I brought up the Lowrider S because the the Lance did write an article about the Breakout, the Harley Breakout, and the Indian Sport Chief side by side, but but those are not necessarily uh, yeah direct I mean, competitors. I mean, the Breakout's a much it's like a like big front wheel on it and like contrast right. cut wheels, and it's it's more of like a fat tire um, kind of like classic early 2000s style uh harley cruiser in my mind whereas harley's lowrider s is a is like supposed to be a sportier version of uh of their sort of like big engined cruiser bike and it has a similar aesthetic with like the with the little bikini fairing yeah. and um and and that kind of thing that that's my take anyway yeah, I, I, when I wrote the article, it was really just I chose those two because they both were new for this year, uh, and one you of the you chose those two to to confuse Spurgeon Dunbar is why you did it. Well, it, it apparently worked, but that wasn't my <laughs> initial initial intention. But they were both new for this year. The Breakout is an older model, but it's been gone for a while, and Harley brought it back. But uh, as one of the readers pointed out, yeah, the real the real competitor for the direct competitor for the, the Sport Chief is the Lowrider S. But uh, I think the comparison between the Sport Chief and the Breakout gets to the point that the Spurgeon was making about how important aesthetics are in the cruiser class. Yeah. And I think most people, okay, he instantly gravitated towards the Indian. I think there will be a lot of people who do that. There'll be a lot of people who instantly say, "Well, no, 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 no competition." I look at that, look at that 240 section rear tire on that <laughs> Breakout, man. That's cool. And look at that. 21 inch front wheel and it's like so much cooler than that plain old you know boring single colored fairing on that indian sport chief so it, what i'm saying is the aesthetics do play such a uh an important role that i think everybody knows at first glance which way their interest is going to take them yeah that's fair i think the to to pivot away from aesthetics for a moment the reason that i'm excited about the um the sport chief um as such as it is, such as my excitement is, is that I think that that's a, a more, it's it's a more intriguing um, direction for 
uh, for cruisers to go, in my opinion, this whole um, I, this this kind of like West Coast themed uh, style of of bike, where like they added an inch of rear suspension travel to the Sport Chief. Um, it's it's like it's a little it's a little taller. It's a little bit more. It's meant to be a little more aggressive. And they're reaching for a very specific aesthetic. The um, as you know, the sort of like um, I don't know FX Harley FXR centric. Um, style of of uh of cruiser but and that style is becoming very popular yeah it's becoming popular and i like that it's becoming popular because it is oftentimes the mods that are made to these bikes and now um you know the factory modifications for these bikes or factory uh, updates and upgrades that are made often follow what the culture is doing right and a lot of what the culture has been pushing for these bikes is more performance oriented stuff like make the bike a little bit taller make it a little bit leaner make it so that it can kind of lean over and it's not like they're trying to make a sport bike out of the cruiser they're just trying to make it a slightly more capable motorcycle and i think that that's the right way to go i, I like i mean i like the harley lowrider s I, I think it it moves in the right direction um for what i would do with that bike because riding harley has a certain charm and it's fun i like it but i often find myself kind of like my excitement is hemmed in by some of the mechanical limitations of the bike and these updates to these models are moving away from those limitations, which I think is great. Lance, you, and I take you, it by your no, silence that you no, I was agree. waiting. I thought Lance was going to jump right in. <laughs> no, I, I, I do agree, and I think it's also, you know, we saw the the bagger phenomena that we kind of touched on earlier when we were talking about baggers, yeah. where people were adding performance and 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 making those you know higher performance motorcycles than the, they came from the factory, and this is sort of the next step. These are adding some of that performance to. These other models that are that are also in the lineup. So I, yeah, I agree. I think it's a good a good evolution. I mean, from so a what about from, from a performance standpoint too? These engines are fantastic. If you have if, yeah, if you're listening to this, fun. you know I, I know that sometimes you know we get kind of pigeonholed here. But if you've never ridden one of these modern big V twin engines, they're just phenomenal. They make torque in all the right places. They have a tremendous <laughs> uh, sound to them. Um, they just, there, there's something that is completely unique uh, about how these engines really just touch your, your soul. And I think that's the reason that they are still so popular with such a large portion of the motorcycling audience. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's, uh, I think that's fair. So to, to pivot away from the, the sport chief and uh, lowrider S and kind of like uh, big American V twin stuff, what do you make of the Honda Rebel 1100T, which um, if you haven't, if you're not familiar uh, viewing and listening audience, um, the Rebel 1100 is the uh, uh, Honda Cruiser, which is what Honda Rebel means basically, <laughs> um, that uses the 1100cc parallel twin um, that came out a couple years ago. And the new one is 1100T, which has, like I said, that little fairing and some hard bags on it. Do, do, do you guys think that that's a sort of a worthy upgrade or update for that bike or does it seem silly? I mean, it's it, to me, it's it's almost stretching it to say it's a new model because uh, yeah, that's fair. They put they put some put some bags on it, they put a fairing on it. It's worth noting that this is the has the DCT, the dual clutch transmission. So um, you're you're getting that for your money too, and right. so you're basically paying twelve hundred dollars more over the DCT regular Rebel just for fairing and and bags. But I mean. The, the the bags only hold thirty five liters combined, but this is the uh, same thing we saw Harley Davidson do with the Lowrider ST, and and we made the same comment, you know, when yeah. we had done the episode with Patrick Garvin, and yeah. we said, well, why can't you just, I mean, just get an, a, a used Lowrider and put some bags on it, and you're good to go, and the the audience was like, what are you talking about? This is like it's done from the factory, so the bags fit and the colors match. Like there is an audience out there that likes to have it from the factory all in one package. I, I understand that, but yeah. what's the what would be the difference in in buying a regular um, Rebel 1100 with a DCT and buying Honda accessory saddlebags and bolting them on and buying a Honda accessory fairing and bolting it on and you're saying they I've accessorized you. I've accessorized my Rebel to my liking. I just <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, it's I, good I think... to have choices, but I, it's not like <laughs> I don't think it's like a huge step forward. Yeah, that's fair. I, I think that it does. I was just singing Honda's praises about the that XR150 and, and many other uh, things. Um, but it does feel a little phoned in to me, the, the, <laughs> the Rebel 1100T, I have to say. And it makes me wonder how many people want 
a kind of half-baked bagger, you know, um, especially people who like Hondas. I don't know. It, it, it's it's yeah. especially the audience of uh, the Honda audience, which is a, uh, I, I dare say, a practical bunch in to, to generalize. You know, like any, every generalization is very difficult. But I, but it, it's it's a tricky thing to me to, to to imagine someone saying like, yeah, I want the thing that's like a little bit different and weird instead of. I mean, I've been watching the Japanese manufacturers particularly struggle with the cruiser. Yeah. since before Spurgeon Dunbar was born. Uh, sad <laughs> hey, to Zach, say, but Zach I have. Quartz and I are, are both 1983, baby. It's not just one <laughs> or the other. Well, whatever. Either one of you. Before the two of you were born, I, they were they were struggling with what to do about the cruiser market. Yeah. And I feel like, to some extent, they still are. Um, yeah. We haven't seen a huge, you know, huge success in that. And they've tried pretty much everything. And I don't think that this is necessarily anything different. Well, I think Lance, it's important to note that Lance was born in uh, 1912, <laughs> so he was there when Hondra introduced the the original um, 750, and he saw what you know what groundbreaking results that motorcycle had, and he was really disappointed that when uh, what was it, 30 odd years later or 20 odd years later, they couldn't do the same thing with their cruiser motorcycles. So that's a, it's an important note, Lance. You're what 112 at this point. Something like that. I can't forget <laughs> my senility. So, Joe, well, that's, <laughs> that's one of the reasons we like having you on, Lance, is your, your vast experience. Let's put it that way. Um, joking aside, I am not going to discount the same. I'm not going to make the same mistake we made last season or the season before, whenever it was that we talked about the, the low rider ST. I think there are people that want to walk into a dealership. They want to say that's the that's what I want. I I, yeah. I like I like the look of that. I like the fact that I can put luggage in this. I, I that's the bike that I want. So yeah. I, I'm not going to discount that. What I am going to say is I think Honda gets a win <laughs> because. So for those of you listening, we've said this a few times now, and you probably don't know what we're talking about if you're newer into motorcycling. The term DCT stands for dual clutch transmission. It's essentially an automatic. So if you don't want to learn how to shift, which is a barrier to entry for a lot of people getting into motorcycling that don't know how to use a manual transmission. Maybe you don't want to. Um, and up until that, there's been very few options outside of the scooter world. Honda's putting the DCT transmission on so many different motorcycles. So the fact that they're putting this on the Rebel 1100T or the Rebel 1100 means that you can get into the cruiser segment. You can get into a very, uh, I would say, uh, not you know it's an up spec cruiser it might not be making you know 120 foot pounds of torque but it's a it's a peppy motor as opposed to it's some full, of the smaller it's full ones size, it's a full, it's a full size, size. Bike. exactly yeah. and you don't have to use a clutch you can put the bike in in drive and you can pull back on the throttle and you can just ride around and i think that is where i am surprised that we have seen no other competitors come up and challenge honda in this yeah. world of automatic motorcycles and it's not just, uh, keep in mind, the dual clutch transmission is not just an automatic transmission in, in the same way that your, your 97 Caprice Classic was an automatic transmission. It's, a, it's, a, it's an advanced automatic transmission. It's, a, it's a, this twin clutch uh, system that's ostensibly the same thing that is used in uh, you know, performance cars and in, in MotoGP. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it's, I'm not saying it has a MotoGP transmission. But it is an advanced automatic transmission, and it's cool, and uh, and they're neat to use. And Spurgeon's right. And any time the DCT comes up, Honda deserves a, a small pat on the back for sure. And you can also paddle shift it too. So if you do yeah, want to, if right. you do want to play yeah. around with shifting uh, because you're interested in the theory behind it, um, you can convert it over into like a manual paddle shift mode. So anyway, <sighs> I, that's what really I think sets the Honda Rebel apart from these other bikes that we're talking about, like the Sport Chief or the Lowrider or the Breakout. I think that Honda has something to offer the market that one, I, I think there's probably a lot of new riders that are coming into the market that aren't really aware that this technology exists. And maybe if more people were aware of it because they're listening to a, a motorcycle podcast, that they'd be like, oh, like that sounds cool to me. Um, but also it's just, it's a, it's a different option that the other manufacturers aren't providing at this point. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I, I, uh, I do. do what, you guys got any other bikes on your list, Lance? Guest honors. You got you got anything else to say? I, I got like one or two more, but we should we should probably wrap this up. No, I, I, none others. I but it, just to follow up what Spurgeon said, I'm going to put in my obligatory plug to go over to Common Tread, where we have a couple of articles. Uh, one titled 
why are there why aren't there more automatic motorcycles and another one titled best automatic motorcycles so we'll get a little searching if you're interested in that topic and we have more more for you lance i are, are, i would say uh zach i have one more but what what is your what is your pick before before i go well, I technically have two more on my list. Oh, but go I, for it. I no, was going to mention I was going to mention the, the Yamaha X Max because I'm it's a it's a scooter with a TFT dash and some like connectivity. And I know that we've seen TFT dashes and we, like we've seen fancy displays and Bluetooth connectivity and navigation and that kind of thing. I just think seeing it on a on a small scooter or or like a relatively small scooter anyway is a is a fun thing. And I and I know that like practical motorcycles aren't sexy; they're not fun to talk about. But I get a kick out of it, and I'm excited to try uh the x-max because i think if you're gonna have a nice um big clear full color dash with navigation on it why not have it on a bike that's made to be in an urban environment where you are often lost yeah i mean as someone that's not sexy nor not fun to talk about i can understand why you would appreciate this so much <laughs> what i will ask you is because I, I knew you were going to bring this up and and for those of you listening the X Max is a is a scooter that Zach hasn't shut up about. Uh, he was very <laughs> disappointed when they postponed the press launch because Zach was supposed yeah. to go ride this. I was supposed um, to go next week. Or I, I know this week. I know next week. So yeah. is the re like out of all the other scooters out there? And th and this is a legitimate question because you and I haven't talked about this. Is the only reason that you're that excited about the X Max is because of all the connectivity? So like that tech the technology is really that that worlds no, apart from the other options out there that it would, no, it would convince you to that. buy one no not necessarily no it's, it's not just that i just I'm, I'm i think i like scooters in general i think that scooters are fun whether it's a getting around a, the the paddock at a, at a at a racetrack or uh or getting around a city i just think scooters are great I, i've had a lot of good experiences and i think they're um underrated by um the vast majority of people who would consider themselves motorcycling veterans because they think they're just like you know they're like too cool for school people don't think they want scooters because they're not fast they're not uh performance oriented they're not whatever I just, and i just like them um and so anytime a, a um a scooter gets an update like this you know like that some effort was put into making it more modern um or um more uh usable more utilitarian i mean I'm, I'm interested um, so that's, that's, that's all it is. It's not, Some it's of, not like, a, I don't want to geek out too much and pretend like it's the first time a motorcycle's ever had a cool dash on it. You know, whatever. I, I will say that some of the most fun I've ever had on two wheels is when I had a Honda Metropolitan 50 in the garage when I was living in Nashville. <laughs> and what I will say about the Honda Metropolitan 50 as a little approachable, affordable machine, everybody wanted to take a ride on it. It didn't scare yeah. anybody. I yeah. can't, I can't tell you, I, I probably can't, I, I can't remember any time where i was parked on a motorcycle where a stranger came up and said can i ride that however on with a honda metropolitan 50 people just somehow felt that it was acceptable to walk up and be like oh can i try that can i ride that and i, and I think that is the approachable nature that scootering provides to the masses and maybe if we had more scooters in the world more people would be on on two wheels yeah, but i, there I don't you know there you go Lance, yeah. Lance obviously well, disagrees. Look at him down yeah, there. Yeah, sorry. Lance fell asleep. Lance, wake up. Lance. <laughs> nope, I, we're, I, I totally concur. <laughs> oh, he concurs. Good. That's that's a good, that's always the right thing to say when you wake up from a nap on high side, low side, is to say, yes, I concur. <laughs> um, I, I, have, so, I have one that I think Lance would probably have something to say on. Um, okay. So Hit us. we talked about touring as far as like the Honda Rebel 1100T, but what about the sport touring segment? And and the one bike that has gotten revised, or so I've read for for 2023, is the Ducati Super Sport 950. Um, there, it's got it's got a styling update. It's got some technology differences. There's an S version. Uh, so, Lance, I know you rode an older version of this. The point is, I like this bike. And I think that Ducati does it a disservice because if you go to Ducati's website right now and you pull down the drop down and you go to Ducati Super Sport 950, first of all, their website's very confusing. I was trying to find information <laughs> about this bike and I was like hitting buttons and pulling tabs and I was like, just give me the information in front of my face. But every photo of this motorcycle is on the racetrack. It's like leaning over, dragging knee, and I get it. Ducati's aggressive and it's red. But, like, why would you not just show some riders out on a scenic byway with the hard bags on it saying, hey, this is a bike that's sporty, but it's also a bike you can take a trip on? Lance, 
Any thoughts on that bike, having ridden one and done, done a review on one for us? Yeah, I I, uh, I put about, I don't know, maybe 750 miles on the, the first, 2018 was when it came out, and um, I borrowed one, had the uh, factory luggage on it, um, and I went into it thinking a lot like you are, that, hey, this will be a great sport touring bike, and I did enjoy the bike a lot. Uh, I think it's beautiful, and it's got a lot going for it. I did end my time with it, though, thinking this is really at the very end of the sport touring spectrum on the sport side. Um, the The riding position is, is pretty sporty. Uh, more to the point, the luggage was really expensive for what it was <laughs> and didn't, didn't work that great. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're really looking for that sport touring middle ground or even a sportier sport touring, it's, it's, it's got some things to consider. Let me just say that I enjoyed the bike, liked riding it, but I can, I can almost see them wanting to position it as a sport bike for the street, which is how they position it. They don't call it a sport touring. They call it a sport bike for the street, right? Uh, rather than a sport touring bike. I think if 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 you want to go sport touring, they're going to try to push you towards other bikes in the lineup. Well, mm. I, I think it's important mm, to note fair. too, because you know you made the comment earlier about uh, Spurge is the adventure guy and Zach's the aggressive track <laughs> guy, but you are you are arguably the sport touring guy for mm. Common Tread. Yeah. Like you have yeah. a Honda VFR with color matched hard luggage in your garage as we speak. Yeah. Um, and I know that you've also gotten to a point where you're pro you're probably trying to make that VFR a little more comfortable for yourself than you would have you know maybe yes. ten or fifteen years ago. Um, do you feel that if if you if you're looking for an aggressive sport sport touring motorcycle, do you feel that there's something better out there than the Ducati in 2023? I mean, it really depends on your your particular use case, but I would say for, just to give you sort of the comparison. Uh, the the Ducati's more a little more aggressive than my VFR for mm -hmm. one. It would be more. It's definitely more aggressive in terms of ergonomics and so forth than something like a, a Ninja Thousand mm -hmm. Kawasaki Ninja Thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, or even a has, Suzuki GXS One Thousand GT. Oh, definitely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, um, the Suzuki GSX S One Thousand GT Plus is more comfortable and. They all have, they all, and faster, and they all have, um, you know, better, more waterproof, sturdier luggage options than the Ducati. So again, I go back to that and I look at the Ducati as, I want a, I want a sport bike, but I'm, I'm, I'm honestly maybe going to go to the track once a year, but I really want to ride a Panigale all the time and, and, you know, have my, my neck at a 40 degree angle trying to see where I'm going. <laughs> Um, I think that's where the super sport makes a lot of sense, more so than the person who's really going to rack up a lot of long distance miles. Fair enough. Cool. All right. Yeah. Well, we could stop the discussion right now, and we probably should. <laughs> but um, but I wanted to put one last question to the both of you, um, which or to each of you, I should say, uh, which is. What's a bike that you would like to see debut in 2023? In fact, maybe the bike will come out two weeks after we record this and then, uh, you know, whatever. And then when it comes out, uh, people will be like, those idiots, I can't believe they published that podcast that was so out of date. But the point is, in 2023, is there a bike that you think, man, why, I feel like we could see this. It feels reasonable and, and plausible, and, I, and I'd love to see it. Guest honors. Uh, you, yeah, guest honors. Lance, you're up. Well, I mean... Since we still don't know about the Trans Alp, I mean, I feel like that's that's the biggest question mark hanging over us right now. Mm, okay. okay. Uh, and and I will tell you this: the, the the amount of interest I've seen by looking at readership of our articles on Common Tread, there's a lot of people out there who are really interested in that model. And so I think it it is sort of the biggest unanswered question hanging over us at this point in the in the new model introduction season. Okay. I, I would say Spurge. that um, we spent all this time talking about 2023 motorcycles. We are living in the future. Uh, we didn't talk about electric <laughs> motorcycles whatsoever. Um, mm. And I think that's because there's still so many question marks around the viability for this. You know, we started the episode talking around swappable batteries. We're, we're now going to kind of round up a little bit here in the fact that like, 
are there any electric motorcycles that any of us would be excited to go out and put our herd earned money down on right now? Um, mm. You know, Zach, I know that you, you spent some time on the Sondors recently. We don't need to get into that because we are going to have a separate episode uh, around EV motorcycles. But, you know, Jen wrote an article around the best electric motorcycles, or I'm sorry, it's a Teamzilla article uh, around the best electric motorcycles on the market in 2023. And it just are, are, is there anything out there that's capturing anyone's fancy in the EV segment? There's a lot happening. I mean, it, it's just that let's face it. At this point, we're also we've all been burned so many times by promises <laughs> that uh, weren't fulfilled, and companies that we thought had great futures that ended up going out of business, and so forth. That everybody's just a little bit gun shy. But I mean, we've seen some really interesting prototypes. We've seen some things come to market, but it's just who knows who's going to be here, you know, a year from now, and and that's that's the real question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I this is, this is a tricky one. I I maintain my stance has been for some time now that I think uh, major manufacturers stepping into that space is what it's going to take to get me excited. I was excited about that BMW CEO four electric scooter, and granted, it's you know. It's like a little bit more than a prototype. I mean, they're selling them to people, but it's but it's it, it sort of was a, it's a prototype style bike, you know, where they they sort of took parts from other from automotive division and from other parts of the motorcycle division, and they they put together this electric scooter, and it's kind of expensive, but it's cool, and and that that gets me excited when when full sized, fully matured motorcycle companies are producing these bikes. That's what kind of gets me going, and I'm I every time an electric motorcycle manufacturer comes out of the woodwork and makes a bunch of promises about what the bike could be. I just keep thinking like, ah, I want, like, I want to see Honda do this. I want to see Kawasaki do this. I want to see BMW do this more. I want to see, you know, whatever that that's, that's my thinking. So I, 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 I feel maybe the same way as Lance. I struggle to get super excited about. Well, we, stuff. we, Kawasaki has promised us next year, we're going to yeah. see an electric and a hybrid. And yeah. Honda has said that. And Honda's official official strat, strategic document says next year. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll wait and see, but yeah, they keep yeah, promising. Yeah. So yeah. I I think we're just about the end here. Um, yeah. Much like Zach, I have one <laughs> I have one final thing, and this is this is literally fifteen seconds or less from each of you. On limited funds, you don't have to change what motorcycles are currently currently in your garage. Out of the bikes that we've talked about today for twenty twenty three, which one would you? be personally the most excited to add to your garage if you had to add only one lance you know where Ooh. i'm going with this guest honors <laughs> yeah i mean again if i if i get to add it with unlimited funds and i don't have to worry about is it a practical choice or whatever then indian it's be bagger the ZX4R. isn't it isn't no, it oh. zx4r because that would be <laughs> like i say it's just, it's just not the most practical choice it it's but to have it for a, a track day or a sport ride or something would be would be fun. Mm. All right, Zach. Well, that's a good choice. I'm very excited about that bike, but um, but frankly, my garage could use some more practicality uh, <laughs> in it, and so it'd be it would be a, a trans out for me. I got high hopes for that bike, and I hope that uh, I get to find out if those high hopes are lived up to. What about cool. you, Spurge? Uh, Lance, I like where your head was at with the ZX4RR, but I need something that is a bit more streetable for my garage as well. Um, <laughs> so I would, and, and not too much more streetable, because uh, I like the idea of having some track capability, but I would go with the Triumph ST Moto 2. That would be, out of all the ones we talked about today, I would be putting mm. my money down on that one. Nice. So, yeah, great choice. Very good choice. All right. We Oof. made it to another end, another end of an episode. Well, not quite, not quite. Not we have to quite. say goodbye to Lance. I'm, right. I, I, I've been rusty, folks. This is we're just getting back <laughs> into it. So we're going to say goodbye to Lance, and then we are going to talk about viewers' comments. We got some great stuff, and when we've got the, oh, I'm sorry, my producer Chase is making the the the, the Rev <laughs> Trivia sound game. Lance, I'm sorry. Oh, I you thought I was going to get play. off. No, no, no. I it is I was time. Gonna escape. Nope. High side, low side audience, I apologize. Oh. If you are just joining us for the first time as a high side, low side listener, um, please forgive <laughs> us. We've been away from this for like two months, and it's all mm. coming roaring back to me. We have the engine sound guessing game. This has become a, a high side, low side favorite. We are going to – Zach, give them the rules. Give them the rules. Right. 
The Rev Trivia guessing game goes like this. We will hear a 20 to 30 second clip of a motorcycle starting up, revving a few times, idling, shutting off. And then um, as quickly as we feel is possible, uh, we need to put our guesses in. We'll get a hint or two, and then we'll find out what the bike actually is. You can play along with us. If you know what the bike is, shout it out in your car, in your cubicle, in your living room, wherever you are. Um, and one, and of the, uh, one of the pieces of feedback was to play the sound a second time for the audience yes. because that way they won't have to rewind their podcast. <laughs> so we're going to work that in too. But we're gonna are we ready, we're ready to hear the sound, Lance? Huh? Huh? Come on. I, yeah, I'm terrible right. at this game. I, uh, well, everyone's well, terrible at it. Yeah. It's like bowling. Who cares? You don't have to be good for it to be fun. <laughs> Other than Patrick Garvin, that's like two for two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, he's a savant. Yeah. He is. Well, okay, the, everybody. There we go. Let's play take, the sound. Take a moment, play your sound. Let us know what you think. I'm stumped right off the bat. Very, very Muff, interesting. Muffled, like a muffled, high performance. <laughs> Lance, what do you think? Yeah, you, you, you got anything there, Lance? Oh. Guest honors. Tell us what it is, man. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's, well, it could be. I, 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 so my first instinct was 360 degree parallel twin. So. BMW F800 GS or Benelli T TNT 300 because um, it's got that kind of like nasal kind of blah, 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 uh, like warble to it. But like it could be a V4, but I just don't think it is. It could be, a, I was thinking it could be a small V4. I'm going to take another listen. I'm going to take another listen. That, that's 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 not a that's not a 300. There's there's something with some actual displacement behind that. Okay. All right. Let's go with the first hint. Zach, the first hint is a V4. Ah. Okay. Hmm. A V4. So it's but it's not a. That's that's interesting because it's not it's not like a typical like it's definitely not. I mean, it doesn't sound like an a, an Aprilia V4. You know, like an RS V4 or a Tuono or anything like that. And it doesn't sound doesn't sound like a VFR, Lance. You would know a VFR if you heard one, right? Yeah, it doesn't sound like mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe <it's laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give us hint too. Before I pull it over, I am gonna make a guess. I'm gonna say that this is a Modus. A Modus? Uh, no, no, flywheel's too light. Flywheel's too light for a Modus. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Honda NR750, mm. which is technically. So, so okay. for those for those of you listening, a, a Modus is like an American V4. They only <laughs> made a couple of them down in Alabama. Zach's guess is a Honda NR750, which they only technically released in Japan, and then now you can get some of them imported to the U.S. Like yeah, they're like oval piston, goofy. Yeah. Weird any thing. any crazy obscure guess from you, Lance? Before I flip over hint number two. I mean, I, I would lean towards Zach's guess, but I'm just trying to even think of another V4 that it that it that it could be because. Well, are we going to be luck? sad? What other V4s are there? Really quick. Really, uh, wreck your brain. Wreck uh, your brain. Okay, uh, fine. fine. Hint, Just go with the hint. Just go with the hint. Hint number two is also offered in a DCT version. So we know oh, so that this a, is a Honda. This is so probably a, the big adventure uh, bike thing, it's right? A, well, no, it's either a VFR 1200 or a... VFR 1200 uh, then, yeah. Yeah, VFR but, 1200. But the VFR saying, 1200 was also used in the adventure bike. Yeah, which the had VFR 1200 X, right? Yeah. Because that yeah. the, the the original one that you're talking about, Lance, I don't think that had a DCT in it, did it? Yeah, it did. Did it? Okay. Yeah. 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 All it right. Did. Okay. Gotta, so I, so so VFR 1200s. That. I guess that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought the firing order was was like that. I've I've ridden that bike. The answer is a 2013 Honda VFR 1200F. Uh, Claude, I want to say thank you to Claude for sending this one in. Does ah. have a, a damn exhaust on it. That's D A M. So I can't get yelled at by my mom who <laughs> listens to this for using profanity because that's like the, the dam holding up the water. Um, and just a reminder uh, much like Claude, make sure you send in your 
uh, engine sound guessing game exhaust. If you want to play, you can try and stump us like Claude just did. Uh, we need the year, the make, the model, any mods you made to the motorcycle, uh, and about a 30 second clip, start the bike. We need to hear it starting. We need to hear it idling. Give us a few good revs and then let it taper off. But mm. Lance, we, we gave, we, we said, do you think this is a VFR? And to Lance's yeah. credit, he said, doesn't sound like mine. Right, yeah. and it's a different, it's a different, it's different. VFR. Lance totally has a different. VFR 800, totally. different yeah. motor, different engine. Totally yeah. different. And totally. if you have no <laughs> idea what we're talking about now is when you can, well, don't go just yet because you have to listen to us uh, finish talking about the comment <laughs> section here. Uh, presumably you might be driving. You don't want to Google anything when you're driving, but you can look up Honda VFR 1200 versus Honda VFR, or VFR 800 to see the difference. Right, right, right. All right, okay. now we can get rid of Lance and let him get on with his day. <laughs> Lance, right, it's guys. been a pleasure as always to have you around. And even though you're not um, a, a fan of high side, low side, such as it is, high side, low side is a fan of you. And we would I, like you to know that. I am a fan of listening to high side, low side. <laughs> <laughs> Just not a fan of participating. Well, you did you did darn good, kiddo. We appreciate Thank your you. time and your insights. And, um, and uh, we hope that it'll be um sooner than six months before you're back again but if it's but if it's six months we'll take it yeah and if you want to see lance do an instagram live takeover <laughs> throw right. a comment send an email <laughs> if we can get if we can get at least 10 people to send a, an email in <laughs> saying that they want to do an instagram live with lance oliver yes i will pay him his exorbitant fee just to make that happen so send in your Beautiful. emails to high side low side at revzilla.com if you want to see lance live and in person on instagram all right. Okay, Lance, I'm going to do you a favor and bid you adieu so you don't have to listen to Spurgeon anymore. Thank you for hanging out. We appreciate it. All right, guys. My pleasure. Always a pleasure to have Lance on the podcast. If you are, again, new to the high side, low side uh, world, you have no idea what you're about to hear, but God help you because you're still here with us. Um, and if you uh, have stuck around because you're already a high side, low side listener, you know that we're about to give away a t-shirt. Uh, it is time to announce the winner who left us a favorable Apple podcast review. We would ask that you do the same. <laughs> if you can leave us a Apple podcast review, it really does help with our distribution of the podcast itself. And the winner today is AK Snow Skater, who wrote in and said, uh, first ride of last year's Mojave Get On Adventure Fest was a doozy. Already had been on the road for 6,000 miles before the rally and then rode with these two. Uh, these two referring to Zach Quartz and I believe Ari Henning. Uh -huh. Never told us this, but was actually listening to the podcast whilst riding. <laughs> um, while, while I'm tired of listening to the Led Zeppelin or Taylor Swift, um, I go to you guys next. So I'm glad to see that it goes Led Zeppelin, Taylor Swift, and then Zach and Spurgeon on high side, low side. Yeah. Um, and just says, P.S., I'll see you there in a couple months. So we like this for AK uh, Snow Skater. If you're not sure what exactly this individual is talking about, uh, Get On Adventure Fest is a event that Revzilla hosts first in the Mojave Desert in April and then again in the Black Hills of South Dakota in uh, July. And it's basically a big adventure motorcycling event. Uh, it's four days this year, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Zach will be there, I will be there, Ari will be there, Jen, Patrick Garvin, the whole shebang. And we basically just hang out in the desert and ride adventure bikes for four days straight and have a big old party. Mm -hmm. The Mojave Desert's in California, for those, mm -hmm. if, for those if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the geography. Zach and just I bartended so you know. last year. We were, we were honorable bartenders and we just served <laughs> all the guest beer. We gave out we gave out beers left, right, and center. So that is pretty. That's pretty funny. Um, but it's not really a review of the podcast. Well, it's, it's review of the podcast in so much as um, AK Snow Skater has put us in elite company uh, with Led Zeppelin and Taylor Swift as far as uh, who uh, they like to ride with. So that's very very much appreciated. Um, as a friendly reminder, AK Snow Skater, send your mailing address and shirt size to highsidelowside at revzilla.com, and we will send you your free T-shirt. Hopefully. Um, we'll see you again at, uh, in, in California's adventure fest. And, uh, so if you don't send us that stuff, then maybe we can give you a t-shirt there. I don't know. If you, you if, do. if you tried buying a high side, low side t-shirt recently, you notice that the sizes are lacking. <laughs> uh, we have more on order. So for those of you out there that are trying to give us your hard earned money, we'll take it. Uh, and hopefully we will have more of those in stock, uh, by the time you are listening to this podcast. Right. Moving on. 
um, to our high side, low side comment of the episode, you may have caught earlier uh, us mention a, a discussion of dealership ethics. Well, this is why. We got this comment uh, via email, I think. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Producer Chase is yep. going to have to confirm. He's, he's nodding um, yes. Okay. Question from New Zealand. Uh, this is from Robert. Robert says, I bought a brand new Yamaha R7, um, which is this sort of midsize sport bike from Yamaha. Bought a new R7 from a dealership after lusting over saving and finally ordering it, all without riding the motorcycle due to no showroom test models being available. Uh, something to do with COVID. Robert is 28 years old, six foot four, 170 pounds. So uh, it's a tall drink of water. Robert says, I put 1,000 kilometers, about 600 miles on the bike and found it painfully uncomfortable to the point where I avoided riding it. I tried an adjustable rear set, but finally traded it in at a considerable loss. I hold no grudge, but would like to hear your opinion. How much responsibility does a dealership have for ensuring the customer is purchasing a suitable motorcycle for their needs or body type? This is a great question. And Spurgeon Dunbar, you worked at a dealership for a little while, so I'd like you to address this first. I think this could arguably be uh, an entire episode of a podcast because I, nice. I think that I think that when we're getting into the world of dealerships, there's just so much to unpack here, and they're not all created equal. Um, you know, I worked at a dealership where we prided ourselves on wanting to make sure that people got the right bike. We would oftentimes really shy away from selling, you know, sport bikes to 17 year olds. Like we would try and talk them into anything else because it was just, it was so much for a first motorcycle. And I, the, 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 the real answer to Robert's question is that like their job is to make money. They're a business. So right. I think you could argue that if you want to have return customers and you want to practice proper business ethics, you can try and talk people into something different. But if somebody comes in and has their heart set on a motorcycle, is it is it that person's job to tell them to buy something different, or is it that person's mm. job to help, you know, facilitate the desire that that person is saying that they want? And, and I and yep. that gets back yep. into motorcycle education in general. And is that the dealership's responsibility? I think that the dealerships should take on more of an educational portion of this, but mm. I don't know if that's really realistic. What about you? What do you think? I think that Robert is being quite polite in not holding a grudge here because it sounds like he knew what he was going to do when he started riding around. And if the dealership had listened a little bit more, they might've been able to advise on something more appropriate. However, I would ask you this, Robert, if the dealership had talked you into, um, an MT-07 or a Tenere 700, uh, um, uh, a, a naked sporting bike or, uh, an adventure bike using the same engine, for example, um, would you still be lusting after that R7? Would you still be thinking, oh, that's the bike that I want. That's the bike that, or, or did you need that to be part of your sport bike journey to get one, to lust after it, to want it, to save and to get one and then to ride it and think, oh, this isn't really what I wanted. And I, I, <laughs> I don't mean, I'm not trying to put the onus on you and saying that, uh, that, that any or all of this is your fault. Um, but I think that for some people that is a piece of the uh, of the journey that needs to happen. You have to sort of experiment with something, try it to realize that you don't like it. Now, I, I do, in your case, I think that A, the dealer could have been potentially more transparent with what the bike was best at and really should be used for. Um, and I also think that you got kind of pooched on the no, no test ride thing, you know, because it was COVID era or because whatever the situation was, you didn't get a chance but, to try but, it. I think that if you had an opportunity to ride around, you probably with an R7, you would have seen early on that it wasn't, exactly what you wanted. So it was, a, it was a perfect storm in some ways. Right. And, and I think, again, complete on a podcast around like test rides and motorcycling. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think you're giving Robert a bit too much credit here because one of the things Robert doesn't tell us in his email, he uses the language, uh, you know, I've been lusting over, saving, finally ordering. Like, right. I, we don't know if Robert went in and said, hey, guys, I'm trying to find my next motorcycle. Is this appropriate for me? Because the way that this is written, Robert went in and was like, ooh, I want that bike. I got to have that bike. Can you, can you help me get that bike? And, and the dealer might have been like, yeah, okay, you're yeah. lusting after an R7. That makes right. sense. Cool bike. Right. Right. There you go. Okay. Like, so yeah, yeah. Robert's not letting us know, like, how did that conversation at the dealership go? So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to hold the dealership accountable here, and I'm not going to let Robert off scot-free because we don't have all the information. Okay, and and I enough. think part fair of that enough. is like, it, yes, if Robert went in and said, hey, I'm looking for a great commuting bike. I'm a tall rider. You know, I'm afraid of being uncomfortable. 
um, what do you recommend for me? And the dealership was like trying to move R7s because they had six of them on the lot. <laughs> then yes, the dealership can be you know uh, held a little bit to blame here. Yeah, but if Robert yeah. just went in and said, oh, "I want that bike, man. I, I that bike looks so good. I'm so excited to have it in my garage." And the dealership's like, "Well, we can make that happen today. We we deliver <laughs> dreams." Then I, I don't know how much of that falls back true. to the dealership. Yeah, so. fair enough. Fair enough. Well, well. Um, I think that this is a great question. And Robert, I would like to say that I'm sorry that you had that experience because right. I think that um, an R7 is a cool bike, but it just was not right for you. And, uh, and that's too bad. And I hope that the, fi- that the considerable financial loss that you, um, that you uh, were, you know, that you succumbed to in this situation um, doesn't turn you off from um, other bikes in that, in that line of bike or, or motorcycling in general. Uh, and hopefully you found something that you that you like. In fact, you send us another email. If you if you got another bike instead that you really liked, uh, I'd be curious to know what it is. So feel free to follow up if you like. And we've talked about the R7 on the podcast before because I think it is mm. again one of those confused models of like yes. it's an aggressive seating position for the street. Yes. And it's the same thing Zach and I talk about when people are like, oh well, I want to I want to get a a inline 600 cc sport bike for my next motorcycle because I started off on a Ninja 400 and like that seems like the next thing like. These are these are race oriented machines that people have ridden on the street, but you have to know what you're getting yourself into, and it's not mm. the same as a upright, naked, comfortable bike. So true. So enough, 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 enough. Well, thank you very much for your email, Robert. We definitely appreciate it. Um, as a friendly reminder, we love uh, comments from listeners and viewers. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please leave a comment below if you have uh, uh, anything to say or ask. Um, engine sounds as well as comments or questions can also be sent to highside low side at revzilla.com and we would encourage you to share the podcast with your friends we hope that you find it entertaining informative and uh, just all around a good time so zach in closing mm. what have you learned today mm. right right start start a, little... of a new season got ah, new yes. motorcycles it's a new year S- what Season have you seven, mm. episode one, Reflections with Spurgeon and Zach. Well, I'll tell you what I learned. I learned that the updated KTM 890 has the blue tank from the rally, and I cannot wait to pull that off on <laughs> Spurgeon Dunbar when he's riding around, get on Adventure Fest, and he tells someone, like, yeah, I got the rally. And I'll say, like, how do we even know you got the rally? Sure, you got the blue tank, but so does the new bike. The new bike's got the blue tank, too, so you probably just put rally stickers on there, you poser. You're pushing my buttons in a way that I don't appreciate. <laughs> I and I will I know, say, I, I will say, I will say that from what I understand, the only way, up until this point, the only way to get the blue tank or the rally stickers was you had to prove VIN to a KTM dealership to get that. So oh, my hope no. is, is that you can't just go and buy rally stickers with the blue tank because that would be <laughs> that would be one step too far. That would Austria. be a betrayal of trust. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, what's your what's your final note here on the way out the door here, Spurge? Final note is that there's a lot of options for motorcyclists. <laughs> like if you're looking if you're looking at becoming a motorcyclist in 2023, whether it's a a, a little XR 150L from mm-hmm. Honda or it's a, an electric motorcycle or it's a scooter, perhaps you're a, an X Max enthusiast or maybe you want a cruiser but you don't want to learn how to use a transmission. You got a DCT option yeah. in the Honda Rebel. Yeah. Like, there's just so many cool bikes available and they're better than ever. So if you are thinking about riding a motorcycle, if you are a rider <laughs> and you're thinking about upgrading your current motorcycle. 2023 what a year to be alive and on two wheels because there's no Mm. shortage of great bikes that you can put underneath your ass (laughs) i like that uh and you certainly didn't hear it here first but you're gonna hear it here most recently motorcycles are fun everybody Mm. Mm. um Mm. thanks for joining us for this episode of high side low side we so appreciate it and uh welcome to season seven we'll see you in a couple weeks if all goes well adios amigos (laughs) 